Let's go. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 21st of the sixth month on our Creator's calendar, which happens to line up with September 2nd, 2023 on the Gregorian calendar. And we are going over a little treat today. We don't have our whole fellowship, so instead of continuing with Bereshit or Genesis, we're going to do a little segue here for something fun. But this is actually from a book, and I'll put this, I'll put a link to this and the reference where it was referenced in a description for everyone. But the title of this book is Our British Ancestors, Who and What Were They? And it was referenced in a two-volume set called The Missing Links. And these are books that were written in the 1800s, not the newer one by E. Raymond Capt, but a two-volume set that goes over a thousand proofs that the Germanic, Celtic, English-speaking peoples are of what they call Israel or the 12 tribes, right? Specifically of Ephraim and the half-tribe of Manasseh that came to America. But long story short, this happens to be an appendix that has over 100 pages of English words that you can see tied directly to the Hebrew or the... Uh, the language that was spoken by our ancestors. For a recap on this, for anyone who might not be familiar, the language of creation, as mentioned in Yobelim, is Hebrew, or what we call Hebrew. It was Yahudith in scripture, but the language of those who confess, acknowledge, and praise Yahuwah. He took that out of the mouths of everyone at the Tower of Babel, but at the repentance and the prayer of Abram, he gave him the language and then taught him what he would didn't know, as he also gave him the writings of the patriarchs, the book of Hanok, the writings of Lemech, Noach, and so forth, for him to transcribe and study, because he had prayed to be delivered from the evil spirits that were leading men astray. That was originally, he was speaking what they call Chalde here, or Kazdim, and then he would have learned the Hebrew, but as he left there, he went to what we call Syria. And the Armenian people are the cousins of the Hebrews. If you remember, Terah went with him, his father, and Nahor, his brother, and they stayed in Haran. Haran is where Laban was, and both Yitzhak and Yaakov went and got wives from their relations there louis also got his wife from there um but that's the influence of the languages here that you'll see that he's referencing so you have the english word right here is the celtic which is another branch of the hebrews that originally went to the west the english or the germanic peoples if you will originally went into captivity in the northern kingdom and went to the east and they were put in Madai in Persia. They lost some of the language in its use. The Bagad Kafath letters locked into one use, and it was called the universal sound shift that happened in all the Germanic languages at the time, is what they say, right? But the fact of it is they lost the use of the prefixes and the suffixes, and the letters that would fluctuate locked into a use. Um, when they traveled west exclusively, they kept the use of the suffixes and the prefixes, and even today, the Gaelic is most closely related in function to the Hebrew. The Irish is almost identical, word for word and, and vowel for, not, not, not the sound, but the function, the adding of prefixes and suffixes, the construction of the sentences is identical to the Hebrew, even today, if you were to look at that, which is an amazing thing. But... They were the ones that went west first. The Germanic went east first and then migrated into Europe and into the British Isles and into the Americas and elsewhere. And then they were influenced by the Celtic. So you'll see that some of the words are related to them, but most of them that are not come from when they were taken and they went east, just so you can see there is a difference in them. This one is going to be the Hebrew word. And the approximate pronunciation of it, or the phonetic pronunciation, is right here. 
It's not the only way you can pronounce that word in Hebrew, but it's one way that it sounds. And then the meaning of it is exactly what you can see in English carried on even today. There's a plethora, a multitude of words that don't have the same meaning today as they used to. But these ones generally do, which is pretty neat in itself. So not to get carried away anymore. Here's the uh, beginning here. He has aisle, or, and it's corrupted from aisle, right? And he says, see Avery. All right, and that's Allah, Allah, or it's to mount on high. El, or Ella, is to be upon, above. When we say El Elyon, it's El as in mighty one, and then Elyon is in most high. Asp is here we get, this is Zaspo, Zespo, right? Zespo, you drop that one, which is something that happens quite often. And you have Aspo, but Asp, right? And that's a kind of serpent. The dropping of the first letter, especially like a Yod, or in this case, the Zaudi, is a phenomenon that happens with places and names quite often in English words or in Hebrew as they migrated away. You see that in Iberia. Um, you see that in quite a few other words. We'll, we'll go along. You'll see it here. Ace. Hey, brother, can I mention something real quick? Certainly. The, uh, I'm having a little bit of cognitive dissonance on that J there. Can you explain that? Yes. So the letter J in German is a Y sound. That would be Jaspo. And this would be Zespo. That would they're they're saying that that would be how that's pronounced. We don't use a J in that function anymore. But um, you see this phenomenon also in Terry Bloodgett's dissertation when he's writing the transliteration of words. He'll put a J I or a J with the pronunciation, and that's supposed to be a Y because that that's literally how it's pronounced in German. And he's writing about the Germanic language. So he uses it in that context. So in the Hebrew, there's 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 no yod there. So I'm is that is that pronunciation supposed to be it must not be from the Hebrew, it must be from the one of the other languages. Right. Well, it it's uh how it changes over time. That right here, the proper pronunciation would be like zas zasfa or zaspa, zaspa'a, right? Because you would have the, uh, the ayin is a guttural. It it doesn't always, uh, like ya'akob, it takes that extra hiccup in your throat, if you will. But because that's difficult to do, and zaudi is a difficult letter, as time goes on, these consistently will drop. And like you look at Zidon or Zor, it'll drop the T or it will drop the Z, and keep it uh, an easier pronunciation. Other words, they do the same thing. You see this one in the per, the approximate phonetic pronunciation. He has a J here, which would have been like a Y sound. But in the English, that's completely gone. If this is accurate, then it was already changing at that time, which makes that make more sense. This is a phenomenon that you see happening more and more. Um, Another great example, and this is something that you'll see in the doctrinal dissertation from Terry Bloodgett, which I will also put in the description for anyone that wants to peruse it. But the, the Germanic languages that were influenced by Woden or Odin, which comes from Adon or Master, they tend to take the gutturals like the Aleph and put a W in front of it. And there's a whole bunch of words from the English that he shows that does that. But that W is not in front of any of them beforehand. It's just the way that they, um, the way that they mush mouth the words, if you will, as it changed over time, that was just the phenomenon that happened. It's specifically with the English. And if you recall Ephraim, even back in scripture, he could not pronounce Shibboleth correctly. It was Sibboleth to him. And because he couldn't pronounce Shibboleth, he was caught and killed when they were fighting against Manasseh's brother. It, 
that was in the time of the judges for anyone not familiar with it. Okay, got it. Thank you, brother, for the explanation. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And I don't I don't have all the answers for every nuance of how these changed, but when you see as we go over this, you'll see over and over again this kind of phenomenon. And then it'll make more sense to you. And that's the only thing I can encourage for everybody. If you just take the time, look at it, see what it says. This could be someone's bias as well with the J. Because we know that there is no J phonetic in the original Hebrew whatsoever. And every J that, like I was mentioning before, that was originally used was for a Y sound. Right here you have ace which he says comes from ish which is unity of existence that ish with an aleph in front of it is also the word for a man you have this the other way just so you know yod sheen i believe that is a gift or present in hebrew the next word here is rest which we have influenced from the celtic or celtic there and then the Hebrew right here is the resh, resh or resh, sheen, tau. And if you just, there's no, you notice there's no vowels here. There is no vowels in the Hebrew here either. But if you pronounce the consonant, resh, resh, rest, and you drop that sh because again, Ephraim could not do the s there or the sh sound. It becomes rest, and that's exactly where that word comes from. To detain, reshat, keep back, hinder, catch in a net. And you can find where that is used as net or snare, to detain, catch, or keep back in a few places. But he mentions Exodus, what is that, 27, 4 and 5, Ezekiel 12, 13, and etc. Right? For rest, you also have arrest, right? And then arrestor, which are English words that come from that. Roaster is detained for service, right? And also here we have, I love this word right here, appetite. Comes from this word, petach, he, right? Petach, I think that's supposed to be a he, not a he. But patach with an aleph in front of it means to entice or seduce. So a patach is I'm enticed or seduced. So your appetite is when you're enticed to the food or the thing that you're smelling, right? Which I find interesting. A base, a bash, sorry, they say that says see bashful, right? Acre, agriculture. An agar, which is the Latin version of that word, okay, is a field or portion of land to be cultivated, enters as such into Syriac, Arabic, Saxon, and all Indo-European languages, right? What they call Indo-European, the acre. And that comes right from here, Aleph, Kof, Resh, Akar, acre, all right? The, um, the Greek, Akra. Tos, all right, and the uh, Latin Agricola, who was a German, or not a German, I'm sorry, he was a Roman general that fought against the Caldonians at one point, but that word agar comes from the root there, and it means to cultivate the soil or a husbandman. Here we have the universal word that pretty much everyone's familiar with, amen. It comes right from amen, right? It means truth, certainty, to be, or be it so, or so be it, as we say. Amen and amen, right? Ask, seek, accuse. This one is interesting. Um, it seems to have done the opposite of what we see with Hebrew here, but the word accuse has a Gaelic influence, Achwen, right? And 
I said Aquin, but that is not how that's pronounced. They actually pronounce their W's and Y's and N's differently than what we're familiar with. Probably to sound more like this. So please forgive me. I'm not familiar with that yet. But it comes from this Hebrew word, which is hey, wa, kaf, yod, chayth, which they have hu, kiach, right? Hu, kiach, to mean, it means to accuse or complain of, all right? And when you keep in mind hu, kiach is harder to say than accuse, it just became simpler over time but the meaning stayed the same. Right here we have affluence from and the Celtic haflug from flug right here, pay, lamed, gimel. And the pay, just so you know, is the open mouth, but it can make the P or the PH sound. So it's the pa or the fa, which is with the affluence or flug right here, which is to flow. Abide in the K in the Celtic or the, the Gaelic, there it is, beat, beat, right? Abide, you get rid of the aleph there, and you have bide or beat. The uh, phenomena I had mentioned to you, especially in Babylonian, the Chaldean or the Babylonian language had a T for the D and it had a, an S for the tau. Right. So you can see that the tau here of the bait was a it was a D in Chaldean or Babylonian, which influenced how this changed to bide or bith. Right. And bith means to dwell or bide. It's literally where we get bait or bait, where we get the word for a house as well. And the letter bet, the second letter of the aleph bet. But where you also have abide, you have abode, the different vowel denoting a, a tense change, but the meaning is similar. The same phenomenon that was from the Hebrew carried into English, right? Arrhenius from arag, and it means a web to weave like a spider. It's where we get the words in English for arraign, to argue, A-R-G, A-R-G, right? Argument. Originally, an argument was not a contest of wills or fighting with someone, but to, um, to have a discourse with someone, to lay out your, your theme, apparently like a spider's web, to lay your points by point to, to, prove, your argue, to prove your side of the story, if you will. But that was what an argument was. It's also where we get the word for... Oh, I'm sorry, a range is different. It looks like it would be similar right here, a range and argument to weave like a spider, but he has it lining up with where ayin resh kof, which he has as a ring. And this one, while it might be accurate, because this is where we get to a range and order, that ng is not where we get a cough from. The cough is a k. And while that did soften on occasion where you get the CH kind of sound, and that might have come from it, the word Eric is also where we get, like Ericology is to arrange an order. So there is that. But arrange. Brother, yeah. in the previous word, it's kind of interesting. For the Greek, it's arachne, like arachnophobia. It's kind of interesting. Right For here. The Greek word, uh, that... Okay. Yeah. Arach. Arachne, I can see that. And that is literally arachne is where we get the word for a spider. So thank you for that, brother. And in any time, feel free to pipe in. I cannot read the Greek very well. I'm still learning. Me too. Hey, you're, you are better at it than I am, though. Let's be honest. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> All right. And then we have array here. And this is an interesting one, Africa. Af, meaning heat or violence. And the af is also like the, the flare of your nostrils or for the word for anger in Hebrew. Correct me if I'm wrong there. 
but Africa or Afric, heat, violence, darkness, cruelty. The dark places of the earth are full of cruelty, which is in Psalms where that word is used. And that is dark and hot Africa. That, that's pretty self-explanatory. All right. Ale in English, Yule in Celtic or Gaelic, and that is also Ele or Ela to elevate, to raise as the spirits and etc. And that was the Yule log that they would burn, right? Apricot, as in Africa, if it's to heat or requiring heat, where that word comes from. And that's the difference between the AF there and the AP, same letters. The same thing you can see in the word for Hebrew, for example. In Egypt, you have the city that was north of Goshen, or in the north area of the Nile Delta, if you will, the tributaries that all branch off from the main river in the north of the land in Egypt that go into the Mediterranean there. The uh, one of the cities they lived in, they call Avaris. Avaris is Hebrew. The Aleph and the Hay sound, as you saw right here, get mixed up on occasion, the A and the H. That's an, it's a phenomenon you'll see more than once. But it's where we get the word for Avery, Abri, Iberian, Hebrew, Iberia, um, and the derivatives that come from those. And that's all from just the one word. And they even have it in modern Hebrew as Ivrit today. So it just depends on the pronunciation, but it's all from the same stem. You'll find that in a few different words, and especially with the Gad Kafath letters. The pay, the bait, okay, the um, chayth, those are the ones where you'll see that the, the phonetics can change on them, where you'll get a P or an F, or you'll get different, uh, the CH instead of a K, or a softening of a harder guttural, all right? But the reason why those change is because they had a propensity, it, it literally does it. It literally did it in the language as a natural function of it that was lost over time. An amazing way to see that very clearly is in Dr. Birol Barrick's Hebrew grammar class that he put on YouTube in the Master Seminary. He also has a, 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 a web page where it's for free, and he goes over the classical or biblical Hebrew and its pronunciation. He's very thorough. It's a really amazing class. I highly encourage it if you want to learn how it's supposed to be pronounced to read properly. Um, but to continue here, arm comes from racham, racham, amphilix, or amphilux in the Latin. Racham is to embrace, to encircle or surround. That uh, rachamim is also the word for compassion. Adding the Aleph in there is I am, I will embrace or I will have compassion, which is an arm, like you put your arm over someone. So that's interesting. And also where we get armor. All, the Celtic ul or al, and that comes from kol. Ol comes from kol. And also the approximate cal. He puts cal here because in this letter, you have cough and lamed. You don't have a wa or you don't have any vowel sound. So unless you are reading vowel points into it, that would be cal for anyone. But throughout the Dead Sea Scrolls and throughout the Hebrew Masoretic text, they will put the what's called the comments hatuf. Or I'm sorry, the... Um, I'm, I might be getting that wrong. That might be the half comments. But anyways, the, when they have a comments, the vowel marking for the ah sound that looks like a little T below a letter, and then it's on another letter that closes a syllable. 
which means it doesn't start its own, that would make an O sound. It's part of the phenomenon of the Masoretic vowel pointing system. You can look that up for yourself to confirm it. But that would that's why they say coal with an O when they're pronouncing that. And when you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, almost universally, you'll find where it has cough, wa, lamed to make the coal sound because they use before the advent of the Masoretic text and its culmination in around 1500 AD, they used what a system of vowels that they called mater lectonis or the mother tongues, if you will. And it was using different consonants or different Hebrew letters as vowel letters in occasion. The aleph, the uh, hey, the yod, the ayin on occasion, although they won't admit to that one, and then the wa. And those are the very letters you have in English, A, E, I, O, and U today. Although the hey was the letter H in English, the E still is a vowel, but we have remnants of the fact that the hey or the H sound was a vowel. And you can see that when you look further into the old English and you look at any of those people where it says A or un, when you put un in front of a vowel word, it's almost universally in front of an H word, just like you say, an honor to be here instead of a honor. But that's carrying over directly from what we have in the Hebrew there. All right, to continue. So kol, ol or all, kal is where we get our all or everyone, right? Whole comes from that. Adamant. Right. Adam is a precious stone or to cut. Adamant. Diamond comes from that. You drop the the aleph there, right? Dama is to cut. Admiral. That's ad Adelen Tado. That's Spanish. Amril, French, right? Comes from Amar or emer, emer, which is a commander, to command, to give the word of command. Amar is literally the word, right? Emery is wise finds, or fine sayings, fine words is how it's defined in the Hebrew there. But he always comes and speaks to them. That's usually Amar. When he calls, it's Karah. And then this word is interchanged with Debar and translated as the word of Yahuwah in scripture. <clears throat> Excuse me. This one is interesting or interesting, if you will. Alum, Alim, right? Alim, Alim or Alum, if you have a wa there, is an astringent. And I thought, well, aluminum, how is that an astringent? But when you look it up, aluminum citrate is an astringent it's literally what that is and where we get that word from angle this one's a very interesting one ongel from the celtic comes from anak anak to and that ka gal right but anak is to encompass to surround hold or contain where we get the word for angular or hank Anchor, all of those are part of that. Avery, which was mentioned above, right? Avis, the Latin Isles, right? A comes from, it says a Eve here is how they, Ive or Ave is how they have that pronounced. Ave, if. But I don't know if that would be the only way you'd pronounce that. Either way, that right there is the word for a bird or to fly or wing. It's also the root. We have other words for like zephin and zuf to take wing, float, or fly in Hebrew. Avidity, awa, ave, they say. 
to covet, to desire, that Ave for this word and pronunciation would have been from the influence of the Babylonian Hebrew, from the Yahudim that came back from Babylon to the land that would have been there at the time our Mashiach came and then were later taken and dispersed from there. And the ones that migrated into Europe that became known as the Ashkenazi Jews, if you will, or the Ashkenazi Yahudim, as opposed to the Sephardic, which went to Spain, or the Moroccan, which went to Morocco, right? The, they usually were named for the places that they went and congregated in. But the ones that went you into... You know what's interesting about that one? Is, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, brother. I just wanted to say real quick, what's interesting about that one as well is uh, it seems to be a relation with uh, Dawid. We get David, but uh, Dawid in uh, in that he was also after um, Yahweh's heart. And so you have the that correlation with that word right there in the, the Cal... Uh, I can't look at the screen while I'm talking. Sorry. No, that, that is true. Dawid and David, you have that influence of the uh, wa becoming a V sound. Right. And then at the end, it's the, it says it's a desire. So he was after you know, you know, Yahuwah's heart. So that's pretty interesting. Oh, that's right. Very. Thank you for that. I didn't think about that connection. So w there is that. And then you can see there is a legitimate use here. While that was not the original of the use of the wa, it's a fact that that's what happened to it. We can trace it from its origin, where it went, and how it was influencing later languages, even into English right here. So my point in sharing that, and thank you, brother, for that was another one with David, Dawid and David. You, you can see when this would have been brought into the English, or at least what would have influenced its pronunciation. Because the, the wa is a V, was never used in the Hebrew proper until the Babylonian Yahudim brought it back. Excuse me. And from as far as I'm aware, they were the ones that use it exclusively, even to today. Um, not, not that it, it is no more wrong than anyone speaking English because this is a language that our creator has given us to use. I'm not trying to judge anyone. I'm I'm just trying to point out facts and, and the things that we can say, hey, this is where it was from. This is the influence that it had. We can see the effects of it and the, the, the fact behind it. That's all. And what's also interesting is that that is uh, one of the place markers. There's, a, there's a, not all the time, but there's a few places uh, in, in several of the manuscripts, the, uh, you know, within 300 years, first 300 years, Mashiach, uh, where... It's place marked, which, you know, uh, designates that to the readers at the time, they were they were directed to a Hebraic to to a Hebraic pronunciation, uh, you know, away from uh, what a Greek pronunciation is. So usually showing that in some way the Greek was insufficient in the proper pronunciation. And uh, and I think that when it is written out in Greek, it is similar to Dawid, but it was still kind of a mystery to me exactly uh what it would have been exactly so anyways if that makes sense. right i get that and just for anyone that doesn't he was saying that the way that they would transliterate dawid he believes was a close approximation to how it was supposed to sound but it was one of the words dawid specifically in relation to the beloved or the patriarch that our mishiach came from Whenever it was in the original manuscripts, they used one of the placeholders or the the Greek letters with a line over it, like they would do with the name Yahuwah, Yahushua, Elohim, Ruach, and uh, the word for Adam as man, as opposed to just the word for a man. When they were talking about him or his things, they would use the placeholder. And then when they were just using any old spirit, they would just use the, the Greek or the Latin word for it because that wasn't um it wasn't impermissible to use in that capacity but it was to make a distinction that you there was no way to properly say his name in the greek they didn't have a hey i believe if i was you know the proper way to pronounce the hey or the yod and one of those and then i know in greek they don't or in latin they don't have the letter hey 
So maybe that, that was that one. Either way, it was impossible for them to properly use those languages to say these words correctly. So they would have the placeholders there. And before the placeholders, which was roughly around 300 AD, when Constantine, Sixtus, and those that were in collusion with the Nicolaitans that were usurping the, the Roman assembly and the, uh, the assemblies in Antioch is where they butted at, right? Um, they, uh, see, I lost what I was going to say. They were splitting their influence of the wrong doctrines and corrupting the Roman assembly. But before then, before it was enforced that you could not use the Hebrew, they would actually have Greek manuscripts with the paleo writing of his name. I don't know if they used other words or not, but I know that was significant. I agree. All right, back on track here. And if you want, we can skip through A's and go to different ones too. There's literally over 100 pages here, but I want you to see just some of these here. Effect, effect, right? Effect, which is Aleph Pei cough this one goes down as a cough so feet it doesn't mean anything it's just a phenomenon of the modern hebrew that they have some letters they call so feet letters or final form letters that happen at the end of a word like this letter mame which is the m is closed the cough a wa a noon a pay these letters will have a leg extended down I think the Zaudi as well is different too. There's like five of them. But point being, it doesn't change anything in the language. It's just a phenomenon that they have with the Masoretic text. But to affect, a thok is uh, affect, right? Is to constrain, put a force on or to bind. Also to affix, right? A part is where we get the word for far. And again, P and F. Okay. Atmosphere. Atem, where they get the athem, right, is obscured or cloudy or vapory, where we get ether, possibly. This is also asthma, asthmatic. Uh, what, what is that? At, I don't know what that word is. I can't say that one, sorry. Animal from enough, enough is to breathe through the nostrils. That would be atmos, atmos. Atmos, okay. That was the M, right. Okay, I can see that there. It's just backwards from the main. All right, animal, animate, to breathe through the nostrils, right? Animation, enough. New word here. I see yes. Eos eyes Latinum. That different section here. Apple, Afel, Avel is round, rich, plump, juicy. So the Afel, that should have been a pay, I think, if they were how that would have changed. But you can see the phenomenon where the F became a P and then the P, because it was in the middle of the word there, doubled. Just like you see here, just like you can see in middle, puddle, muddle, diddle, right? It, it's a phenomenon in English that happens, that comes straight from the Hebrew as well. Whenever you add a hey as a prefix, you usually will double the next letter's consonant. Like, it's not ha mashiach, it's ham mashiach. Just put together ham mashiach as one word. And they do that as a natural phenomenon of the language, which you can still see carried down into the English in its way. A days, right? This is chaza, or chadez, or chaza. I don't know where they get the D there. Hax, has okay. So axe, edge, acute, acuity, acute, uh, acutelate, acumen, hatchet, haza, 
right? Chaz, it's to cut, part, or divide. And that's where all those come from, which is interesting. But just from this word right here, the difficulty of a guttural and the Zion, these are both these are both not easy for your mouth to pronounce. And while it's the same phenomenon, you can definitely see in the Germanic, you go back to the Gothic and the original Germanic languages before they came into Germany, they were a lot more guttural, they were a lot more slower and difficult to pronounce and say. It just, uh, it's a natural thing to want to make things easier. And chaza or chaza, chaz, right? Becoming edge, axe, acute. These are easier to pronounce. That's all. But the meaning is there. Age. They have two words that it could come from. They say eth, which eth. Brother, can I mention something about the previous one? Yes, of course. Just for uh, just for a methodology that we find in the Greek, uh, just like in that that the, the Greek pronunciation for the axe, you'll see above it, it has the the hacks. And so, although in the Greek there, it, it would think that it's axine, it actually is pronounced haxine. The that that the the that hard H sound was a letter called eta that was dropped like within 200 years of the language just like the sheen and uh there's a couple other letters i can't remember off the top of my head but that's why one of the reasons why like the sheen uh was one of the reasons why they had a hard time really transliterating properly uh yahushua um mashiach so that's one of the reasons i believe that they did the uh, had to resort to doing the place markers with the macron the line over the top because of because of that reason but it's interesting so like also we find in the, in the greek you have uh in the greek if you look at the at the wording it actually looks like alleluia and you'll see sometimes people will say alleluia uh, oh. based off of that like trying to do a true uh, transliteration from what our eyes see but actually that was one of the letters the eta and it looks the eta as you're driving down the road you see the yellow sign uh, that lets us know that up a, up ahead is a a road coming up on the right hand side, and it's not a road. It's not a four way. Uh, it's not a like like a a, a, a four way. I guess it would be a stop. It's not a stop though. It's just a road. Like if there's a road coming up on the right, and they're trying to give you the heads up that hey, there's a road coming up on the right. So it looks like an H with the right leg completely taken away. That's what the that's what the etta looked like. And uh, so that word is actually, uh, it's, it is uh, haxne, hack, but the H is not there because it's been dropped. So it's just interesting. Just interesting. That is awesome. Thank you for that. And the other, one of those other letters was the digamma. You know what? I, thank you for correcting me. That is, that you're right. It is, it's actually the digamma. Well, no, no. The digamma is the W. That's the dub, the hard W sound. Yeah, yeah. Right. You're right. That's another one that was dropped. Exactly. It's the the sound is the hard W, but the the letter itself is where we get our F. Although the sound for the F is from our P, which is the P. And that's why these things are all over. But um, the more you learn, it's it's interesting. So thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. But I I may be incorrect. Actually, that that sign that has the the right leg of the h that actually might be the digamma i'd have to go back and, and remember but um i am correct about the dropping of the hard h though <laughs> oh no you're right i meant the digamma is another letter that they lost shortly after the language because they it was the sixth letter it's where we have the wa from and they dropped that in the ancient greek and all their letters shift over that's why their z was the, the seventh numerical but the sixth letter in their in their alphabet right Thank you for that. We have het. They say et here, but that's a chet and a tau. That might have, might they might have wanted an aleph tau there, for et, and then et right here an ayin tau, which is a time, right? Eta is now in Hebrew, right? It's the time made evident, but et, if that was supposed to be aleph tau, is that placeholder. And they say that it means a year or an age, annual time, or year by year. And that's where we get the word for age from. Aloe, 
right here from alo, right? Alo means aloe, a plant so called. And then the Greek here, I presume, is pretty much in line with that. A, ha, ha is a note of exclamation. Ak, backwards. So it, if you know about how the chayth works in the language there, you say like chanak or chanakam, uh, um, chayim, when you have it at the beginning or in the middle of a word, the guttural, the consonant takes precedence at the end of a word, the vowel takes first. So it's ach. When you have ruach, it's that chayth at the end of the word that makes the ach sound. So you have cha right here, but ach in the Celtic, like it got flipped around. That is something that you'll see both in English words and in Celtic or Gaelic words from the Hebrew on occasion. Another one is when it says that he will speak to them with a strange tongue and a foreign lip. That word is le'eg, and le'eg is Gaelic backwards, or gale, if you will, and then you have the ik as the suffix there. But ha is a note of exclamation, and aha, ha, right? Ha, ha, same thing. Ha, ha, okay? At, at literally means the same word. Same pronunciation, hasn't changed one bit. Algebra, they say, is uh, is Middle Eastern, right? But it's a Hebrew word as well. It's the art of equation. Algebra was known to the ancients 400 BC. Okay. Another Hebrew word that people are somewhat familiar with is abracadabra, right? Abara, I create kadabara, as I speak, abracadabra. Right. Amorous, merits, merts, right? You drop that aleph there. Merts or merts, it's to compel, restrain, or bind down. Ambassador from basad, all right? Basad is to tell or a messenger. Makshada or a uh, makshad, right? Right here, aurora, or sorry, aurora, or, or, right? Or, aura is the morning light. I, I thought these were pretty neat. I've known this word for a long time, orient, oriental, and I never, I don't know why I never connected the dots, but the Orient, just like the word for east, is also the word for first or to bore through, but it has to do with its first because that's where the light, the or, first appears. And instead of having that word, kadem, as the word for east anymore, they just have the word as the light because that's what they're talking about. And that's what the orient is. You orient yourself to the light or the east. And that's where the Orientals come from, the East, or where the light begins, right? Which is where that word comes from, or is light or shining. Oriflame, Orifius, these are Orum, there's a Latin, orange, which is a bright color, or a shining color. Abot, here's another one where the T and the D are interchangeable there. And again, the English doubles that second letter. Abad and Abad from the Hebrew, or Abba, is a father or a teacher. Abit, right? Abbey, same thing. To adore. Adar, adore, if you had a wa there, that would be the actual perfect sound of that. But Adar, adore, is to magnify to reverence, to honor, to adorn. Same thing with adorot, adoroth, adorn, a magnificent apparel. Anger, anger do do, 
anger dude is a knock. A knock is to groan in silence. Anguish. Anach, angst. All right. These are related words to it, and that means to suffer. Anxious. Anxiety. Annoy. Well, I have a question for you. Yes. Regarding, regarding, uh, here, let me look back over here. Uh, regarding ing, the one that's set, the first column that says ing, or the second column that says ing. Mm -hmm. Have you, have you heard of, ever heard of a deity called ing? Ing, the suffering one, kind of like Tammuz or, um, Brachius. Because I've heard it said before, and I don't remember the specifics, but like when we, the usage of the word, um, you know, uh, running, laughing, that at the end of the word there, the ing, that somehow some some have said that it has to do with uh, relating somehow to like some deity or something. You ever heard that? I'm I'm looking right now. I've never heard of that, but that doesn't surprise me. I mean, a lot of the things, unfortunately, they pick up words and they adopt these things and venerate it just like they would do with false hero worship and turn them into to false mighty ones. So the just like we use a ray of light from the sun and that comes from the false pagan mighty one, Ra, you know, Ra. They call it Ra in English today. Um, That wasn't the Egyptian pronunciation. That could be something of the same effect. Do you know if it was a, a Celtic one or something else? Yeah, that'd be a hard one to get around, huh? The ing, the ing. Right. <laughs> How do we keep that one out of our mouth? Yeah, it's just the uh, ingus. It's the mighty one ing. Yep. What is it? Ingus? Ingus is the, the G O D ing is the ingus. Okay, so there's actually, it's not just the ing, there's actually another part to it. Okay, that makes sense. And they say that it possibly means ancestor. Ing was a Germanic false mighty one. <laughs> and we oh, think, okay, here we go. <laughs> uh -oh. Well, Germans, Celts, it's the, it's the same people group, and the ing right here is the Celtic. But um, that could have to do with suffering and anguish to groan in silence, right? That is interesting. We have annoy with that one, ache. All right. So anciently, it's atch, o, ah, utterance of pain, which you have ats, ats, stringent, pinching, painful, sharp, and constrained, where we get our word for ache or oh, ah, right? There's that's a different letter from the other one. Is that the same H pronunciation or is that something else? Do you know? I would, I don't know. That's a good question. Since the, uh, since there's no H attached to it on any, any of the other uh, right. uh, columns, I, I would think. All right. Here's a few more. We have agony. This is gana or gunny, gane, where you have the aleph again dropped, but that's breathing with pain. After achar, they say afer right here, afer, but that's not an f sound in the Hebrew at all. It might have, it might have, well, obviously did change because after is acher which means behind in time or what came after and again acher after this one is easier to say but the meaning hasn't changed across is says see cross at at means near or at aleph tau apt epa in gaelic apad athad right here is to be fitted or imitated. Avat or abat is fitted or contrived, where we get the word for ape. Air or 
air or light ether and again i'd mentioned that one before that's a root from that weather here's another phenomenon with the english i'd mentioned to you the alephs like adon were, were the word for master and a few other ones with the scandinavian germanic peoples or the ones that came from the parthian empire at its fall and was, was led into europe by odin and his children they tended to make a W sound in place of the Aleph. And that's why you have Woden instead of Odin or Adon on there. You also have wood instead of Ood for a, a wood offering that's mentioned in scripture and a few other words that they have the W right there on it. Ariel, another one. Axel, Ixel, right? That's Atziel. Axili, axili, they say is that one. That's an axillar arm joint, which is pretty neat. I'll have to look that one up. I know that's related to a word for like to to create or fashion something when you're making an image, if I remember correctly. Or that could be related to the word for like rescue or exporting something. Ash tree, a shell, a tree with the llama dropped, right? Ash, ash right here, anything consumed by fire. Ash is literally fire as well, right? Deposit or residuum of burning. It's the residue of what's left. As assation, roasting, assert, firewood, asylum. A shell is a retreat, a sacred retiring place a grove asylum pretty neat and we know that's the uh suffix from latin there hazel the tree of which so many of the british groves were formed a shell hazel right oak and hazel were the chief trees and that was written by tacitus in his annals agitate hagidi Hagid, <laughs> to drive or compel. Um, Nagid, Nagid, right, is to be high and conspicuous, like in your face, ah, to make yourself completely out in the open and known. So just for uh, an idea there. Act. Ase, Oshe, to act, do, perform. Ah, carries right over, Aleph, hey, ah. As, asin, this is Aleph, noon, samic. Ants is to urge or press. Asinus is the Latin verge, right? And an ass or a donkey is one that you had to press or compel and force to do something. It says without bitter bridle, they won't come near you in scripture, right? Asp, they have asp right here, which is to coil up as a snake. That asp, they have pH there, but that can just be a P as easy. And it's literally the same word. There's no change to it or meaning of it. Sipa or sifa, right? Sibilare is Latin silver, French zark. Or I'm sorry, that's a different one. But these are all a kind of snake from its hissing noise, all right? Right? Anyways, Ark from Zarach, Zarach, right, is a hollow building. Zark, right? And you drop that TS sound and it's just the word for an Ark. Eight or eight Old English, an island, an I, right, is an island in Hebrew, A-I. Athletic is Talach, right? Talach, which this should be the Chet again, because that's a C-H, so this is a typo for anyone. But that means to struggle. You put the Aleph in front is I am struggling or my struggle. And that's athletic. 
or an athlete, if you will. Arc, right? Arc, arc, Aleph Resh Kof is progress, chief, or principle. Like the arc of a building, the arch, if you will. Sorry, not arc. I'm pronouncing that wrong. The arch of the building. And um, the cough at the end of a word, while it makes the K sound normally, it is softened into a CH at the end. It, you see that in like Baruch, which is with a cough instead of a, a chayth, but it's Baruch and a few other words there. Angel. Okay. That's Engla. Egla. Egla, right, with the softening or the, the mush mouthing of the word, quite often you'll have an N or an M put in these words where there is a guttural, like a, a gimel or a chaith, and it would M or N it, they call it me, not metastasizing, that's the wrong word, but it sounds something similar to that in the, the phenomenon, the, the name that they call it. It's it's prevalent throughout the English, and you can see this is just one of the examples of it, where it adds an N, but otherwise it's the same words, Aleph, Gimel, Lamed. Aleph, Gimel, Lamed. And then the He is to make evident or reveal, right? But Aleph, Gimel, He, it means to reveal or declare, right? Agonize, Yiga, or Igon right there, is to fatigue or overwhelm. This one I'd mentioned earlier, but not on line here. When we have the words in English for betwixt or between, that is the Hebrew betuch, betuch. And you see they have the CK right there, but betuch. And that is from the midst or between, betwixt, literally what that word is. Breach of sea, which is basque, which is mud moistened with water. Beach, basque, right? Bazaar, bazaar, right? Bazaar, literally, is a covered market. Battles, batel, right? Vacation bills, batin, it's batel, it's a vacations leaving off. Fatten, that would be fatten or vatten, right? Batten, it's a large bellied. Sometimes these words will change in ways that are not the norm, like a B to an F is not a normal morphology of the of a letter, but it does happen on occasion. You you do see some phenomenon with that. As we go through, I, I'm not an expert in any of this stuff by any measure. I just happen to have read a lot of it and had the pleasure of being able to connect some things and to see these things. So, biscuit. It's bizach, right? Bish, bishak is a meal moistened with water, right? They say. It's where we get the word as biscuit, twice baked, but query, is it twice baked or is it not rather as basket all right burst it says see press and then the word for a female dog right i don't i don't really cuss i don't have any problems with the word itself but people use it in an, in a rude manner so i'm not going to worry about that point is I, I, have, I have a funny little story about that uh, i tried to explain to my children as they were as they were, my son and my daughter, as they were growing up, you know, they go through the phases. Unfortunately, they went to public school. Um, but, you know, they, they would hear the other children cussing and uh, and then they would bring bring that home. And so I one of the ways I tried to uh, get them away from that was explaining to them where the root of certain words where they came from. And uh, one of the things was I explained to my my daughter, especially in this, the, the word um bitch that you know it was it's just it's a it's a, a female dog who's pregnant you know and uh so one day she was going down the road with uh, my mom had taken her somewhere and they're going down the road and she had seen a, a dog on the side of the road that was obviously was pregnant or had been pregnant it was obvious and and 
and it was a lady who was who was walking the dog and my daughter goes look grandma a bitch <laughs> was like, Shanoa. <laughs> what is it? Shanoa, pregnant dog and my mom was like oh okay <laughs> right I wish you I could off see the my mom's face. <laughs> I, I my son's done that to me too because they it's innocence they don't know better they just take it from what it is and when you teach them what the word means it, it's innocent right it doesn't mean anything that's how those things should be but you can see where that comes from because you know a female dog is especially a pregnant one or is known as that because it, of their behavior if you remember the characters of unclean animals are what we are supposed to abstain from practicing and the shameful behavior of female dogs is pretty prevalent if you pay any attention to them. They don't have a single husband or stay within a monogamous relationship in any capacity. It is a shameful behavior for a woman to act that way or for a guy to act that way for that matter. And that's what Bish is literally from, where it came from. And for a side note for that, just real quick, the uh, dog in Hebrew is the word for fish. But it's that it's that lively thing that moves. It's proliferation, and and uh, it is a bountiful in procreation, which is where they get they say the derivation of the word dog as a, a dog today. It says if the derivation, sorry, derivation, derivation, sorry, of dog from dog, procreation, i.e., salacious, lecherous, be accepted, meaning you know, a hound dog, right? Then there can be no reason why bitch from bish should not be accepted, meaning shameful, explaining the character that you're supposed to abstain from, okay? The propensities of these animals were notorious to ancients as well as moderns, and remarks to that effect are to be found in classical and scriptural witnesses. And then just real quick with this last page, belligerent, also, where, where we get lechem, right? Belechem is to fight. The word lechem, like the word for bread in Bethlehem, is lechem. And that also is the word to fight or to, to wage a battle. Belechem, belem, right? Balsam, basam, is an odoriferous plant, a spice, sweet, agreeable smell. And you see, the only thing we did there is add an L and then brick. This, this one's really, really awesome. Comes right from brick, right out of the Hebrew. Although they have a Q here and a cough there. So I don't know if it's a spell miss typo on one or the other, excuse me, but brick is a bright shining stone, like a coal of fire, which is why they call those red ones bricks. <laughs> so, um, Bob willing, we can go over this more some other time. There's literally, over 100 pages and we did less than 10 i think not even out of the second letter but it's an amazing connection it's it's lovely to learn you can really solidify in your mind that we are the hebrew peoples that are foretold to be his it's based on the language the history and everything doesn't make us better than anyone else because the covenant is literally open to all people and you're either grafted in as a natural or a wild branch, but you have to be grafted in. The, the, even the natural branches are cut off if you don't continue in his loving kindness, just like it mentions. But with that, I think uh, we'll call it good for this Shabbat, unless anyone has anything else. But you all have a wonderful Shabbat, and we will see you next time.